Hi, John. Hi, Kim. Hi, Joyce. Hello, everyone. Hi, Eric. Be right back. Hi, Kim. Hey guys. How's it going? Eric, are you there? I'm back. Okay. Um, uh, just a quick note here about the uh, training spreadsheet. Um, it doesn't have the current, I know that it's, you've updated it and it was updated on 9.4, but it doesn't indicate that on the, the web uh, board site itself uh, just might be a little confusing to someone might go there and say oh this isn't the the updated one whenever you know you can manage to can you shoot change. an email to Michelle well no you you took care of the you took care of it or was she I'm still just saying I'm not gonna be able to I'm not I don't have time to take care of it until Michelle's back probably which is only in a couple weeks but if you shoot an email to Michelle she can take care of it when she's back okay sure Hi, Pat. Hi, Gary. You're both muted. I'm not muted any longer. Okay. <laughs> Hello, all, so far. Hi, Pat. Good to see you again. Yes. <laughs> I see Eric every day. Pretty much. It seems. I need to get a job at the town. <laughs> Don't you have I, a filing clerk or something, I guess. <laughs> she keeps <us> busy.
Hi, Justin. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, now we can. Okay. Yes. Loud and clear. Uh, playing around with my audio settings. I think I got it fixed now. Hi, Sarah Linda. Oh, she's just connecting. You're muted, Sarah Linda. There. Okay. Okay, we're just waiting for Edith. Um, we'll wait another minute and then we'll get started. Well, why don't we get started? And I'm sure Edith will be joining us when she can. Uh, the Town of Canandaigua Environmental Conservation Board meeting is now in session. Oops. Okay, looks like we've got. Um... Oh, <laughs> join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. That's what that's all about. Nice. <laughs> I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag. To the flag. Of the United States, United States of America, of America and to the to republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. all. Okay, thank you, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to our agenda. Um, we don't have any guests as far as I know. Eric, are we expecting any guests? Anybody let us know that they're coming? Hello, Eric? Oh, sorry, I was muted. No, uh, no guess. No guess. Okay. Um, then going on to the approval of the minutes, I don't know if we can approve the minutes at this meeting because I never got a, a second copy when all the drafts uh, note uh, edits that I had sent. And I don't know if anybody else sent them. We ever got that. Did we, did those all get incorporated? And did anybody else send in edits? I saw a second draft of the minutes, which looked much better than the first draft. I didn't have any further comments on it, but okay. I, I never saw what other comments people made. Okay, I did have some comments on that. Um, so, um, uh, Eric, do you? I that, well, I said, I saw your comments back to me. When was it? it was mainly that um, the there was a uh, board member who was excused. That was Kim, and that was not noted on the, the minutes. And also, we had guests. And so I made some mention. I made a little note about, I didn't know, well, I, I can't remember, it was from Costage Engineering. I couldn't remember his, Evan, I think, Geffen, but I didn't know for sure. And then the Brovitzes, Brovitzes 
were in our meeting, but those were those guests were not uh, noted in the minutes either. So I'm not sure those minutes, though, those edits got into it. I anything else would have been, you know, just a typing. I think it was, and uh, there were some uh, typos. That's all. Yeah. Uh where did you know the guest? I'm just looking at the one that you sent back on the 20th of September. Is it under, was it I put it under, under? under comments. They were all under comments like you had asked. Oh, okay. I didn't redline them. I sent them in comments. I don't see any comments. Oh, well. Well, we'll have to figure out yep. then I guess we'll have what to figure that out because at least we we have to get that that part of the of the minutes right um, because we did have an absence and we did have guests so and then as far as the typos that's you know that's fine uh, so why don't we just um, uh, table this the approval of the September minutes until our next meeting and then we can just clarify what in the heck really did go on and all of that Okay. Okay. Oops. Well, all right. Okay. Report from the development office. I just want to say one thing about the training credits. Uh, training credits, uh, I wanted to um, just to let you know that they have been brought up to date. They were brought up to date on September the 4th. However, if you're going to view them in the board site, you'll have to look under the date that says 730 and those that 730 date is not the correct date but it has been updated on the night on um, September the 4th. So I just want to go through and just um, take a minute to let everybody know where we are with our training credits. Justin you have 3.5 credits. Edith has four credits. Kim you have two credits. Sarah Linda, you've got lots, but four is recorded. Um, I have four. Pat, you have none. And Gary, you have your 12, as we discussed at the last meeting. And we will credit you the other um, eight or so that you do have uh, credit for in January. Um, You're all a bunch of slackers. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, Gary. <laughs> See, but now that you're here, you can, you know, motivate us all to get on board. I think that there were a couple of other, I know that there were a number of us that did the Gypsy Moth uh, seminar. Um, and that's, that's two, actually. I think that was a two hour, or maybe it was a 1.5, I forget. But if you want to have credit for that, and, and um, then just let me know, send me a note, and I'll make sure that everything is brought up to date. We'll have to get this up to date, you know, by December, um, because the town board reviews it um, for the in there before they go into their organizational meeting. Okay. Uh, Eric, do you want to, is there any report of the development office other than uh, those that are mentioned here? Well, I'm curious, were you planning on talking about like the conservation subdivision committee or conservation easement team no. later on or do you, okay. No, you want to do it here, that's fine. Or you okay. can, we can do it later, comprehensive plan. You can take that over now, I think. Yeah, um, so the conservation easement team met, was it last week? My days get all mixed up right now. I think it was last week um, yeah. with Barb Johnson from LaBella talk about revisions to the conservation subdivision ordinance. It seemed like a pretty productive meeting. Um, I think that we're kind of all on the same page as far as what might need to be revised, but she's going to do some additional kind of fact-finding review of the codes based on kind of what we told her, what, what we want to see, what works, what doesn't work in our experience. Um, our next meeting is in October, late October, I believe, and I believe did she say she was going to have a draft by then? I, I thought she might. Um, I don't know who was at that meeting. I wasn't at that meeting. Oh, I didn't sorry. know. I didn't know it was went. You know, it was there. But anyway, that's okay. I don't need to be at every yeah. meeting. Yeah. Um, it was a good meeting. But sure would like to know what her thoughts are, though. If 
uh, when you, you know, when you have them. Um, what is your timeline? What do you, how long do you think this will take? Um, based on where we are right now, I mean, it seems like it probably won't take too long. Uh, I can forward to the ECB what she provided to us, her initial review. Of oh, that would be great. Would you please? That would be a great update for us. So, okay. Because I know, right in, know. The, in the open space uh, master plan, uh, we do have, we are following, or we were following in that document anyway, the conservation subdivision um, code and with some suggestions in it. So it might be helpful for us to review these and then check against the kinds of comments that we made at that time, which was now already a couple of years ago. So um, that would be, we'd appreciate that if you could forward that to us. Sure, I just sent it right to see. You. Okay, great. Well, you're um, the comprehensive plan. I just sent out an email to everybody, or not everybody, the um, CIC and the project team and the town board today with essentially the draft. There are some changes left to be made. The big one is probably the addition of an executive summary. Essentially, the, the main body of it's there. Just got to summarize it. Um, but it's all here. There's also nice little links into the document so that you can quickly navigate around. Um, That's a great feature. But it's kind of all here. If anybody wants a copy, it's available on the FTP site. Oh, it is? Oh, good. Yeah, I just put it up there, so it's okay. right there. Not plan. Um, take a look. Let me know uh, what comments you have. There is quite a lot there. It's 125 pages right now. I'm going to change, at least add a couple more. Um, yeah, I think. Our next step for the comp plan project team will be to uh, finalize this draft, get it ready for public hearing. Um, we'll have to hold the public hearing of the project team. Once that's done and the comments are incorporated into that, then it will go to the town board for their, them to hold the public hearing, potential adoption at that point. I think what needs to be done as far as, in my opinion, changing this before moving forward, there are probably too many action items that may need to be parsed down a little bit. Um, you know, this is for five to 10 years. There might be a little too much there. Obviously, you want a little bit of extra meat to kind of make your choices during that time, but too much maybe kind of dif uh, dilutes the priority items. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to send it. Well, I'm going to send it to the different department heads to see. Uh, specifically if there's anything that they were missing or that they think needs to be added. But please take a look and let me know. Okay. I've started the review and I just got a couple of things already, so I'm only a couple pages in. But anyway, all right. Thank you very much for all of that, Eric. Okay, going on to the results of previous applications. Yep. Uh, Finger Lakes Construction for Ortloff, they moved the... Well, they shrunk the proposed building by quite a lot. I think it's probably less than half of what was initially proposed mm -hmm. and moved it uh, very far back or further back than what it was proposed then. I think the zoning board did approve it, but they approved it at like a 70-foot setback from the stream. Really? Uh, oh. Yeah. So, I'll get into that one. Okay. Burnout, Burnout right for Lyman. Uh, I believe one of the comments was partly related to the um, the retaining wall, uh, the retaining wall details. Uh, they did provide all that, and there was also a comment letter in MRB's group, MRB group, MRB group's letter. So it's conditioned on that being provided. Um, that was approved, and uh, also some more silt fence details to protect that. Uh, the Costage Engineering for Brobitz on Menteith Drive, the variance and the site plan were approved. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly special on that as far as conditions. 
Grove for Chrysler, that one was approved. Um, I think we're all in agreement that they did a relatively good job of placing it. The Fox Ridge subdivision for 5B3, this was approved. I don't think there is anything special about this one, really, as far as conditions or anything like that. Uh, and the Covington English one, that was withdrawn. Oh. Huh. That's it. Okay. We got our camp comprehensive plan update and the uh, conservation subdivision review. Okay. Uh, nothing from the CIC referrals, nothing from the ordinance committee this meeting. That's good. And referrals from the PRC. Um, I think you all got a copy of the, um, the draft um, comments that Sarah Linda sent. So if there's no more questions on the other, other, other uh, things that we saw last month, we'll just jump right into this then. CPN 20051, Sarah Linda, you want to take us through that? Well, why don't you have Eric describe it to begin with? Okay. Sure. Um, so first off, I want to apologize a little bit. This application has changed slightly in the last couple of days. So Sarah Linda, I'm not sure if you had seen this one because we just got this plat um, a couple of days ago. But there was, it was initially a uh, subdividing this larger parcel right here, which is 50 something acres, yeah, 50 acres, into three parcels. There was one, two, three. Um, because this third parcel uh, was kind of laid over top of this easement for a transmission main for a water line and also potential future road, we asked that they remove it and they did. So now it, it is only for two lots. Um, and then like a hammerhead turnaround right there. Um, they'll need four variances here because technically this is all in the AR2 zoning district. Um, so they're lot sized for each of these and lot width for each of them. Eric, can you um, sort of clarify what they're, they have, they're requesting a waiver from the conservation subdivision process. Can you sort of explain yeah. what that's all about? So there's four triggers for what would draw somebody in a conservation subdivision. The relevant one here is over 10% NRI features. There's a large portion of wetland in essentially an unaffected area of part of this subdivision, but the parent parcel having more than 10% uh, wetland would be required to go through conservation subdivision. They're requesting a waiver of that because it does not, but what they're proposing does not affect those constrained areas um, because they're going to do, uh, let me back up. The town and the property owner are working to put in a road essentially right here over top of the transmission main um, going from Purdy to Canningo Farmington Town Line Road. As part of that, um, well, the details are still kind of be, being worked out, but it will likely have to create like a special district for this area um, so that essentially the tax or the, the cost of building that road is borne by these, these parcels, generally the ones that surround it. Um, and so the, the owner will likely try to further subdivide, develop around that road at a later date. And so doing a conservation, right, conservation subdivision right now doesn't necessarily make sense because they'll be doing it at a later date with a better idea of what's going on there. Does that make sense? Okay. That's why they're requesting the waiver. So, so the water line is, is already in uh, with, within uh, that easement, or is that a future water line? It's supposed to begin construction in spring or summer of next year. Okay. And can you give us a little bit of a, some background on mobile road generally and, and the other things that uh, are along mobile road? I mean, how long has it been there? What are the other uses? 
um, the, the, I haven't, I, I didn't have a chance to actually go and drive in and look at it, but from an aerial view, it seems like it's kind of haphazard. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's, it might be incremental it's development. Old. It's pretty old. Uh, I've just yeah. grabbed a map from the other side of my office uh, from the late 80s. It's been there since at least that long. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how long it's been there, but you know it must it was an old trailer park essentially or mobile home park, um, and that's kind of how it's remained. Recently, the uh, the Genecos have purchased a number of them and then resold them, but they've kind of tore down uh, the old manufactured homes, put on new ones, sold those lots, and that's essentially what their intent is for these two is to place the manufactured home parcels similar to the neighboring parcels and then uh, sell them off. So uh, that's kind of the story with these ones on Mobile Road. And then also there's Stella's, which was recently done, and that has access off Mobile Road as well. Mm -hmm. OK. Any more questions, Sarah Linda? Um. Well, the, the subject of the variances has to do with the fact that these lots are significantly smaller than what's required in this zoning district, Correct. right? Yep. Um, and it looks as if the lots are not all that different from the lots along Purdy Road, right? Yeah. Maybe those Correct. are a little bit longer, but not much, in, in some cases, narrower. So are those yeah. also manufactured homes or mobile homes per Purdy Road? Yeah, generally. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what what's why is the zoning for something that's much much different? Um it's it's just kind of how they drew the boundaries. I mean a lot of times the boundaries are drawn to uh parcel boundaries. So like well, the AR2 cuts off here because at one point these were two separate lots. So there's the R120 and the AR2. This the community commercial boundary, I believe, is right here. Oh, no, right here. Uh, I don't know if there, there must have been a parcel boundary right there, would be my guess. And then these ones, uh, further down Mobile Road, the existing lots are zoned R130, the same as the Purdy Road ones. Yeah, R130. So. I'm not sure why they drew the boundaries like that. I guess they still wanted this to be agricultural, I suppose, in here. Um, okay, but, that makes sense. So if if these if this subdivision was in an R130 uh, district, then these variances would not be required. Would, would that be accurate? No, I think they still would. Um, mm. both of these would be, well, the lot seven is okay, would be okay in an R120 district. Um, the lot eight is a little bit smaller, 16,000 square feet, but it matches the, what's further down the road. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, Sarah Linda, you wanna take us through your comments? Um, uh, okay, one other question. Um, sure. The contours show on, on this map in just in the general area of the subdivision. And um, can you just kind of summarize, is this a sloped site or is it relatively flat and it's just, I mean, what's going on there? I, I can't tell the high point, the low point because they don't have the, their- Yeah, they have one foot contours here and five over here, but it is generally flat. That's, of course, why you get some of the ponding or wetland areas towards the back. Um, it'll slope down a little bit here, and then I believe it slopes this way, maybe slightly anyways, because it matches 735 and 735 over there. And then on this side, it slopes up this way. So it kind of drains to the back, and then that runs north, I believe. Okay, um, and if you look at the Encore map for this, it 
it looks as if at the end of Mobile Road, there is a big something or other. I, first, I thought it was a pond, or maybe it's just a clear dirt area. I don't know, but it, there's some feature there that doesn't show up on their map. Um, yeah. The, the map, their map and the Encore maps don't seem to really agree as far as natural resources go because the Encore map doesn't indicate that there is a wetland over there, whereas there, yeah. theirs does. So yeah, so but there, was just... delineated as part of the waterline project, um, as they were kind of planning to put it in. I think they were probably originally trying to go through here, yeah. um, and then they found that there was wetlands in this area, so they had it delineated to avoid it. Um, so that's why that's kind of new, the wetland delineation. And this right here is actually a pile of dirt. I don't remember where exactly it came from, but they did dump some dirt back there a couple of years ago anyways. Okay, so it's basically just a big flat scrubby field with used to be agricultural and now it's just vacant. Yeah. And it's got a little bit of streams and some wetland over it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll just modify this a little bit from what I wrote earlier. Um, this is a request for subdivision of two lots from the larger parcel extending the private mobile road. But the two lots are smaller and, smaller and narrower than required under town zoning, but similar to the six existing lots on the north side of mobile road. Applicant requests a waiver from conservation subdivision process uh, the westernmost, well, I'll cross that out because that's no longer, there is no longer a lot nine. Um, remaining approximately 49 acre vacant parcel is scrubby former farmland with a substantial wetland at the southwest corner. Um, I'll take the rest off. Lot seven appears to have some slope and a stream or wetland crossing it. Uh, is that accurate, actually? I mean, it. On, on their subdivision map, it looks like they are showing showing a, a stream. Maybe it's maybe it's an inter intermittent stream. That's uh, isn't that um, which one's lot seven? Go to lot seven. Well, it, it's oh yeah, eight. that one. Um, yeah, yeah there's a little... thanks. Um, uh, never mind. I I was thinking of something else. I think it is more likely an intermittent stream that part of the site will drain in this direction and then up here the north. okay so that's the reason presumably why that lot is larger so that they can set back from the stream i think it's actually because the the owner has been talking to, for, to somebody to, to purchase it and they just want a larger lot but it certainly offers that effect as well okay um and then open space maps identify the site as old fields. All right, I'll, I'll take out this next sentence. Um, environmental concerns, existing development along Mobile Road has an inconsistent development pattern at odds with the zoning. Much. More long-term planning for the overall parcel seems in order prior to the creation of more non-conforming lots. Um, so my rec draft recommendation is ECB recommends denial of the request to waive the construction subdivision provisions and further long-term planning for the full parcel. So, um, you know, you, you address that in your remarks about why they're going for, um, for this minor subdivision now. I guess they're not prepared to do the uh, long-term planning yet. Um, I, I think it would be a good idea for the town to encourage them to go ahead and do that um, sooner rather we, than later. Yeah, just to be, I apologize because there's a lot of stuff that has happened within the last week. We met with them on Wednesday to kind of talk about this stuff. Um, we have encouraged that actually, um, and I'm sorry, you, you obviously wouldn't be aware, but uh, when this district is formed, you know, we told them essentially what or if the district is formed, we told them kind of what the process would be and also kind of the timeline for uh, when they might receiving, be receiving higher tax bills and then associated with that, when might be a good time for them to start doing this uh, planning, potentially rezoning because it's in the MUO district and also potentially developing the parcel. Essentially, we told them due to the timeline 
you know, you should probably get on it right now, starting like next year or so. So it's likely that they will start doing that because I know that the Genecos are looking to have that road and take advantage of the parcel. Sorry. Okay. To, uh, so the recommendation would still be in conformance with the latest uh, uh, conversations that you've had with the Genecos then regarding the conservation subdivision provisions that were were indicated they wanted to waive? Uh, yeah, I think it's still in line with that. I mean, okay. I don't want to say whether the waiver should be denied or whatnot, but there's certainly, we've told them to plan the remainder of the parcel, especially if there's going to be a road there. Um, and they seem like they're going to. Okay, so um, are we in agreement then that we should keep in our recommendation the request to uh, waive or to deny the request for a waiver? Does that seem appropriate now after the dialogue that we've had here today? I think so. Yes? Yes. Is that Edith? Did, That's did, Edith, yes. I didn't see you sneak in. Okay, so we're so we should just keep the recommendation then the way that it is, and uh, we'll give it to the planning board like this, and and we know that it's still in play, so they can do whatever they need to do with it. Then is that right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Going on to next uh, CPN twenty dash o sixty two, Eric. 3111 Westlake Boulevard. I was surprised that this was on our agenda. They actually got a professionally developed site plan. Uh, didn't think they were going to yeah. be able to do that. That was quick work. Yeah, it really was. Anthony mm -hmm. hammered this one through, or Anthony and Aaron. So, uh, this is 3411 Westlake Boulevard. Uh, you all are likely aware of this parcel because it has a eagle nest on it. Um, so the property owner he wants to make an addition to it. It's right now uh, relatively small. I suppose this is the existing footprint. Um, and it has a carport and a couple of sheds that, uh, according to the owner, are ready to fall down anyways. So he's proposing to construct a garage and an addition on the property, on the dwelling. He has a sewer uh, easement that's pretty much right in front of the existing house, which is mm -hmm. why he can't really build this direction towards the west. And of course he's got the tree over here, uh, certainly constraining his ability to move towards the lake, which we don't really want him to anyways. But he needs uh, site plan approval for the development because of how much disturbance it creates. And also he needs a rear setback variance for 40 feet when 60 feet is required. And then he also added this kind of larger garage, uh, 6.5 feet when 12 feet is required for the side setback. So he needs two variances and um, the Sorry, two variances in site plan. Uh, today, they just brought in this uh, landscape plan. So there is, hopefully this is legible. Um, it, it is on the board page now. I apologize again because I just got today. There is an existing ash tree that they want to take out because it's dead. Uh, they're going to put in a London plane tree. Uh, there's the large cottonwood right here, in the eagle's nest. Um, number of smaller bushes kind of surrounding it. And then uh, they're going to try to screen the garage from the lake as well. Though, if all this grows in, it'll probably be pretty well screened. Uh, there is a rain garden right here. And those are the uh, plantings proposed there as well. Any questions for Eric regarding the site plan? Um, uh, on the landscape plan, um, Eric, you might want to show the existing conditions plan, uh, part of the site plan, because there are some 
there's one enormous tree that is coming out as part of this and, and several others also that are affected that, that don't show up on the landscape plan because they're going to be gone. Um, and also, Eric, if you could um, pull up the photo, photos that I sent you. Do you, have, do you have access to those? Yeah, one second. So this is the first one. You have to go through these at all? Okay. Yes. Um, uh, th this is looking toward the lake. Obviously, um, the property line is. Uh, you, you can see the neighbor's driveway over here, and then their driveway, and the property line presumably is somewhere down along the, in, in between the two, with this row of trees kind of on the line, although their landscape plan makes it look as if the trees are significantly inside the line. I'm not sure exactly where the line is there, but anyway. Um, so the cottonwood tree with the eagle's nest in it is the one that is um, coming up straight up from the one story addition on the right side of the house. Um, the other trees on the right, in the right half of the picture are Intending, well, all the trees are, um, as I understand it, supposed to uh, stay with the exception of there's a, a pine that is just um, to the right of this one story addition. I think that would have to come out, although I didn't, I don't remember seeing that on the uh, plan. But on the left side, you see a great big Norway spruce um, that is right in the vicinity of the carport and the shed that are coming down. And that's got to be a 80, 80 to 100 foot tree. Um, so that one they're proposing to take out. And then on, since there's an addition both on the north and the south side of the house, there's a small ornamental tree on the north side, which also will presumably come out. Although, again, I don't remember seeing that on the site plan. So there are a few more pictures here from different angles, just if you could go through them, Eric. Um, this is looking toward the house from the, from the south and looking back from the lakeside. So this tree that's in the front, the pine there, is one that will have to come out because their kitchen addition will be right in this particular corner, projecting out um, toward the lake, in other words, towards the right, as well as towards the camera. And keep going. Then the next picture is just look, looking to the north towards the city. So this is the cottonwood tree with the um, eagle nest in it. It's got an enormous um, uh, uh, base and root flare there. It's maybe a third of the way from the house out to the um, lake shore. And then keep going. Oh, that, that just shows you a little bit of the height of the tree, uh, the cottonwood. And then here, it is from uh, behind the house. And then the next view, the last view is looking um, uh, to the left from there. So this shows the Norway spruce again and the carport and the shed. So on their site plan, it looks as if the Norway spruce is, the, the new garage is gonna be just a little bit beyond where the Norway spruce is. But I guess they have concluded, they're saying remove tree. Um, right remove tree there and there is an addition there, there's also a tree in the location of the proposed addition there as well as another tree in the location of the other addition the one on the south oh and here's another one over there so there are approximately four or five trees that are going to come out as a result of this project um, one of them a very large substantial tree yeah they don't show the pine which is going to come out but that's obviously got to got to go too so could, could you scroll down a little bit, um, Eric, so we can see the locations of these trees compared to the, to the property line, the trees that are along there.
So on this, it, it's looking as if that 18 inch pi. Um, it, it looks as if the other trees that are along the property the line there don't show on that site plan. But then if you can you jump back to the landscape plan? Existing, existing, existing. Okay. So those are all existing. Okay, yeah, the, these are existing. So this suggests that the property line goes right through those, um, those trees. Yeah. And some of them are, you know, pretty substantial, 18 inch, 20 inch, 20 inch. Um, putting the addition within 5.5 uh, feet of those trees doesn't seem to me like it's going to work. <laughs> I mean, you can't excavate for foundations yeah. that close to a tree yeah. um, and, and have the tree survive. True. So either this plan is not in sync with the other plan or something's not quite right. Um, I do think actually that they drew this based on the... Oh, older. this may be a landscape plan based on the earlier. Oh, that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. After, the, after, after this landscape plan was prepared, then they modified the garage to bring it closer to the property line. That must be the answer. Okay, so these, prop, so these trees which are shown as existing, in fact, yeah, one of them's a catalpa, one of them's an ash, um, and then there's some, some, some sort of scrubbier ones. So those, in fact, are gonna have to come out. That's the, uh, okay, that clears that up. So between those two, the pine and the big spruce and the other ones on the north side, they've got about five or six existing trees that are coming out. But the site overall does have a lot of trees on it. I mean, it, it's a it's a generously sized lot, and um, uh, when they get done with it, the well, if you pan out here, so we can see what the proposal is for replacing uh, for for new trees. Um, So the, the cottonwood to remain is going to be the major tree between the house and the lake. And up there in the upper right, I can't see if that's existing or, yeah, there, there's going to be some additional landscaping over there. But most of stuff. Okay, so want me to go through the here? here? Please. Um, all right. Well, since this only changed, um, I, I didn't have an opportunity. I did have an opportunity to change some of this um, to reflect the new site plan that I only saw today. But some of these numbers are going to need to change, um, uh, mainly the lot coverage stuff, because the building is now bigger than it was when I wrote this. So, okay. Okay. Request is for additions to the existing home, including a north and a south wing, an attached garage, and a detached garage. Total lot coverage increases from 15.6 to 23.5. So now I'm assuming it's going to be more than 23.5, but still less than 25 percent. Is that? Yeah, 24.2. Okay, now it's 24.2. Um, and a variance is requested for a setback from the lake. 60 foot is required. It's now approximately 50 foot, and they are requesting approximately 41 feet. So, um, and that is moving right in the direction of the, um, of the trunk of the cottonwood tree. A variance is also requested for the south side setback. 12 foot is required, 6.51 foot is proposed. And the cottonwood tree near the southeast corner of the house has a bald eagle nest with a five year plus history of successful reproduction. And by the way, this, um, uh, this is a next door neighbor of mine, so I have, personal observation experience with these eagles uh, for a long time. I bet. Um, environmental concerns, um, number one is the threat to the cottonwood tree and the eagles um, uh, nest should be um, due to construction under and near the tree. 
second one is loss of other trees, and uh, the third one is the re requested variance to bring the home closer to the lake reinforces past decisions in favor of l allowing larger homes closer to the lake. This is a trend which is at odds with the town's lakeshore development guidelines and also the town's commitment to improving natural buffers along lakes and streams. Um, that's a little bit different from what I sent out earlier. So um, the recommendation ECB is concerned about the possible effects on the habitat for a widely followed and beloved pair of eagles, a natural resource for town residents. Construction of an addition at the southeast corner of the house cannot be accomplished without the potential for compaction and damage to the root system of the cottonwood tree. While bald eagles are no longer an endangered species on the federal level, they are still afforded some protection at the state level. An endangerment of this pair of eagles whose activities are widely observed by residents and visitors throughout the northeast corner of the lake. ECB recommends that the planning board and ZBA encourage a redesign of the addition to maintain a setback from the lake that is no smaller than the existing and that avoids construction within the drip line of the cottonwood tree in question. ECB also recommends additional information about provisions for roof drainage and replacement of trees to be removed as part of the project. So they have now provided a landscape plan that's, that's new since I wrote this. I'm, I'm not, I don't remember that the plan uh, addresses roof drainage though, although there are some roof rain gardens. Um, yeah, there was. In the plan. Yeah. And I didn't actually get a count. Do we have a count of how many uh, trees are coming out and how many trees are going in? Did they provide that for us? Or are we going to have to look at the their landscape? Their, their landscaping plan is probably is going to be modified um, because of our recommendation, or probably it should be. Um, so I'm just wondering what how balanced the reduction of trees and then the planting of new trees is going to be. Right now the plan shows the removal of three trees. Well, there's two shown removed here and then there's the one ash tree here that the landscape plan shows to be removed. Uh, as you noted, Sarah Linda, there's one, I'm not sure what the diameter is, but the pine or something down here. Um, one over here, five, potentially these ones. Right, and, and one yeah. where the north addition goes. Right. So, uh, uh, I, would just, I would just recommend anyways, requesting a clarification from them on the amount to be removed and balancing it with the amount to be planted. I think the only one that they're proposing to plant is this London plane right here and maybe some smaller ones, what's that type? YFC and TTT. Okay, so five arbor vitae, Japanese maple. That's a long book, the, the, the parcel line there. Uh, That's no, probably where they're, where they're taking those out probably. I don't know. Looks like oh, it's on going. their garage. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let's go near the garage. Cherry tree and the London Plain. So not huge trees. Five arbor right there. Well, the London Plain is a big tree. I mean, that that's you know a, will eventually be comparable in size to um, the cottonwood almost. Yeah, there are species of sycamore. Right. So that's a, that's a good tree on the front. Uh, yeah. I'm guessing they're going to take out that ash tree too in the southern boundary if they're there taking out another ash. Yeah. Just yeah. for preventative. Yeah. And it's in the way of the garage. Well, uh, the recommendation, I would just suggest adding clarification, especially with that addition there. Okay. Um, did. Did anybody get that note, John or, or Sarah Linda, if we're going to also include that note that we just talked about here, balancing the trees taken out with the trees coming in and to make some clarification about how that's all going to work. 
We're definitely, I mean, we, I, I didn't see a shoreline guideline statement either. Is, did that, uh, did I just miss it or do, don't they have one? Say that again? Shoreline guideline statement. They provided one. Uh, they did, I'm sorry, I missed it then, okay. Hey, Eric, I had oh, a question. I had an additional question too, and you got us. Oh, we didn't get a chance to see that then. Uh, sure, what's your question? I'm sorry. Uh, no, regarding, so they say they're going to relocate the utilities that are there, the overhead electrical line. Do they have a plan in place, or is that forthcoming? Because I know a lot will depend on the power company will allow it, like the angles and the distances, which could change where poles get put in or, or what happens out there. No, I don't have any more details right now. Okay. Um, just from experience of trying to move a pole, I, it's a lot more complicated um, to get that approved. Um, and that could impact where new poles go or connections are made. Or structures built. Exactly. <laughs> that we can make that a comment also from our environmental concerns. Sarah Linda, when do Eagle Chicks fledge? Should this construction be timed uh, where it would have less disruption on the on the eagles? Oh, that's a good question. And um, actually, Eric, what, did I understand? Maybe Joyce was the one who told me that the DEC had had put some restrictions on the timing of construction. Um, can you elaborate on that, Joyce or Eric? Yeah, Eric, go yeah. ahead. I believe he is allowed to do exterior construction um, and site work from October 1st until December 31st but that it will cease immediately upon that date. Now he's already behind the eight ball. I, honestly, I'd be kind of shocked if he started this year just because of the amount of time that it will take to kind of do this work. Yeah. It, and, you know, he's got to get all the framing up. I'm assuming the siding, roofing, he's going to seal the house and the garage essentially by December 31st and he can't start construction until the approvals from the planning board will come, you know, if they come, October 27th. So he's a month behind, essentially, already. I knew that that was... Go ahead. I was just going to say, we referred it to the DEC for comment as well, uh, but they haven't gotten back to us yet. What, what do the other members of the board think about this idea of... of advising the planning board that they should not permit the um, uh, the expanded or you know encroaching further towards the lake which is also further towards the cottonwood tree yeah i think that's a right on yeah exactly that's mm -hmm. a protection of the lake shore that's why i'm the shoreline guidelines that's why i was looking for it and then we just got it now i don't know if they've even said anything about that how they're going to protect the shoreline if, because of the variance that they're looking for. So that's, um, would be, I think a big question mark, I think for environmental conservation. But they can't really move, you know, to create a four season house or whatever that they want to live in. They can't really move the other direction. Well, yeah, you're right. They, they have a lot of constraints with this site because of the sewer on the west and the lake on the east. Uh, they do have additional land on the north, though. Um, I mean, they're putting a pretty big addition there. If you look at the floor plans associated, the, the addition on the north is a master bedroom suite. The addition on the south is this garage and a kitchen and three bedrooms upstairs. So um, there is ample room if they wanted to only do a north addition. It may not work out, you know, in, in terms of their desired floor plan as well as this does, but it's not out of the question. I think that they're, the way that the mean high water mark kind of draws back in on either side of the parcel 
they might be running into a variance request if they went in any direction, really. Um, so this is 50 feet from there to there. So, you know, if they put this closer out there, the same way they do it on this side, they kind of flipped it over. They're probably still going to look for. They don't have to there. to make it closer to the lake. They could maintain the the 50 foot setback. They just have to go farther to the north. They would have to rethink it some. And, and they also would be staying away from the cottonwood tree. Yes, I, I think that's the biggest issue for me anyway. I mean, not the biggest, but it is a huge issue here um, for um, for that the cottonwood tree. They're, even that deck that they're proposing, if that's going to be a rebuild, is that, re I'm just looking at um, the photos as, and looking that if they're not going to rebuild the, the proposed the deck, they would they're still kind of in the footprint of the tree. So every any way you look on that one corner, the tree and the eagles are going to be jeopardized in some way. And you can't let that tree die. I mean, that's what we're all getting at here. So if, if that porch is going to be rebuilt, which I'm assuming that's what's happening, right? Well, no, actually, they're leaving the porch. They're adding to it. So that thing that's adding the deck is coming coming towards you in this photograph. They, they show it the will. existing porch, and then they show a um, expanded to the south and to the north. Looks like they probably are taking it down. I think I. That's what I thought. I thought they're taking it down and then they're going to rebuild it. They're going to rebuild it larger. And that's where the tree comes. That's where the tree roots come in. Um, no matter what they do, there, there's going to have to be the, you know, the area of disturbance is right there on the roots of that tree. Maybe it would make sense to ask them to survey the drip line of the tree. Um, that would be a great idea. Because the drip line, it, you know, that defines where the roots are. Right. Um, tell them to stay away from the drip line, mm -hmm. which would mean that all of this, both the deck and the um, kitchen addition would have to go somewhere else. Yeah. That's the only way that we're going to say, you know, that we can yeah. not even be sure, but the only way that we can actually protect the tree. And that's what this is all about, is protecting the tree so we can protect the eagles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does somebody have those notes for, um, for this? For this comment, Sarah Linda, is that something that you can redo and um, yes, I'll, I'll make these modifications and send okay. it to you and John or for everybody. Okay. Is, is the board in agreement with the suggestions that we've made for the change? Yes. Okay. I'm still concerned, but okay, we'll just be positive about this. The best outcome will happen for those little birds. Okay, CPN 20-063. 4789, County Road 16. Eric. Okay. So this is quite a ways down County Road 16, kind of by Dual Road, uh, just a little north of Dual Road. Let's see, right there. Um, they're proposing a relatively small addition uh, to the house. Um, so right now they have kind of an entryway right there, uh, and a patio right here. Well, the kind of patio works its way around there towards the lake. They're proposing to take some of that patio space and convert it to like an interior mudroom, I believe is what it is. Uh, 12 by 18, yeah, 12 by 16 addition there. There's some minor architectural elements, so existing. 
exposed. Just a small addition onto the house. Um, no variance is needed, but since they're in the RLD, close to the lake, uh, they're disturbing above the threshold that would require site plan approval. The only other thing I guess that might be of interest, well, you guys will get into that, but the leaching chambers and septic tank, uh, there's notes here. Let's see. So during excavation, they're going to figure out where everything is, um, adjust if needed, and obviously work with Tyler Rowley. Okay. Any questions for Eric? Okay, Sarah Linda, want to take us through the review? Um, well, in summary, this is a request for a small addition to an existing home, extending the kitchen into an existing patio area. There's no net increase to building coverage, well, or to lot coverage at least, just a swap of patio space for interior space and no change to the septic system or other site features. Environmental concerns, the only thing that struck me was it seemed kind of odd that there are leaching chambers within 100 feet of the lake. And um, so yeah. I would recommend that, and this would probably happen anyway, um, the watershed inspector be involved and he, he obviously will have to be. Um, yeah. So the recommendation is ECB sees no particular environmental issues with this proposal other than to require confirmation by the watershed inspector that the septic system is acceptable. Okay, any conversation regarding um, this report? Okay, I have none either, so let's, we'll just assume we'll send it like that. Our next uh, CPN 20-064, I don't believe that the name is Schwartz, it is Tate on that application. Oh, I'm sorry, my mistake. Yeah, at, at 5279 Black Point Drive. Eric? That is the craziest looking design yeah, really block know. plan that I've ever seen. <laughs> that was, who, who did that? I don't know, I'm getting okay. creative. That is. So uh, this property has two dwellings on it, essentially. There's the main house down by the lake. And then there is what they've called, they're called a bear cabin up a little ways. Um, it is a, well, it's a pre-existing non-conforming use on the lot to single family dwellings. They're proposing to uh, raise and rebuild the cabin uphill. Um, slight change to the footprint, making it a bit larger, a covered deck off to the side. Uh, there's something like a garage to pull into underneath. There's the architectural drawing, and the, there's the entryway walk out on the well, on the west side of the house. This one's looking east. And then the, the deck area. So, I guess I should say also, there's the steep slope. There's the steep slope information. So most of the work occurs within the 25 to 40% slope area. There's some within that 40%. Okay, any questions for Eric? Okay, Sarah Linda, go ahead. Uh, the key points, this is a request to replace an existing small cottage on a steep lakefront parcel to address um, a handicapped access issue for the current owner. 
The existing cottage is about 650 feet. The proposed cottage is 800 feet in footprint, but it's two stories, so it's uh, more living space. Uh, no variances are requested. The existing nonconformities are the fact that it's two single family homes on a single parcel and the cottage is sized below the town's required 1,100 square foot minimum. And uh, they will continue to use the existing utilities and septic system. So no, no site work really outside the immediate vicinity of the uh, cottage itself. Environmental concerns are the construction is on a steep slope and there are approximately 12 trees to be removed in the area around the cottage. So recommendation, ECB recommends strict adherence to the town's steep slope regulations during construction and also suggests that a landscape plan be submitted confirming that new native species trees will be planted in an equivalent number to those lost due to the project. All sounds good to me. Um, the one thing that I made uh, have just noted here in my remarks is that um, the asphalt driveway, the asphalt driveway is on a steep slope and I really didn't get a good uh, uh, opportunity to see how they were going to manage the drainage on that steep slope with that asphalt drive and wondered if we couldn't add to these notes for them to consider a pervious surface uh, driveway uh, in that area. It's not a big area that they're actually considering for this driveway, um, but I, th I think it might, it might just be an opportunity or a suggestion for them to consider that. They, you know, they still have, they're within all their percentages of coverage and all that kind of stuff. So that was just my addition for that. I didn't pick up on that. Is, is the existing driveway asphalt or is it dirt? Yes. Well, the driveway that they were ta they're talking about is from the dirt switchback into the house. Oh, and it goes down into the lower level? Yes. I see. Okay. Um, so that is, um, that was just my, my consideration for that. If, if we could please ask them to take that into consideration. It's steep slope there. Yeah, see it right uh, there. That's it's, it's, you know, it's not big, but it's big enough. Well, anything, any new paved surface is definitely going to produce a lot of runoff that needs to be dealt with. Yep. So I think that's a good okay. suggestion. Exactly. It'll be really important to take good care of the drainage there because uh -huh. it uh, will create more erosion. On the steep slope, right. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, at, and at the corner, on the switchback where this house is located, I can't imagine that we wouldn't have a runoff problem anyway um, right now. Uh, so I think that consideration needs to be taken to, to look at, you know. So if you could add that comment, Sarah Linda, if you were okay, gonna do that, that would be great. Is there any other comments from the board that they would like to make or have see as possible whatevers? We could actually encourage a rain garden in that area. I don't know if that would be, nah, it won't work because it's on a steep slope, I guess. But um, anyway, that drainage is important. Okay, let's move on to our next CPN 20-066. This is uh, Metro's on Bristol Road. We've seen it before. It's coming back. Hey, Eric. So, as Joyce said, this one is on Bristol Road, just next to the hammocks. Uh, I believe the parcel is just around 10 acres in total right now. They're proposing 10 single family dwelling lots and one uh, open space lot. On that open space lot down towards Bristol Road is a water retention area. Uh, there's also supposed to be, I think, a larger swale here. Uh, to do some infiltration. The, that's kind of it. I, mean, I think the lots are right around 8,000 square feet or 5,000? No, 8,000 square feet, 9,000 square feet. Uh, they're requesting a waiver from the lot size there for most of them. Um, I, I don't know. 
there's a trail that they're proposing um, running along here towards the back line. They're also showing one kind of going into the city of Canandaigua, but the city of Canandaigua pretty much said they don't want it. Did they say that? Really? Oh, darn. Pretty much. Yeah, because it, where it dead ends is essentially right into private property. Um, and I guess the city doesn't actually own Arsenal Hill. It wasn't properly deeded to them. It's a paper street that I guess the New York State owns. So there's some question about whether even you could access uh, West Avenue from that whole direction. Anyways, again, the city doesn't want it. Okay. So uh, maybe in the end, it, if it does go through, maybe it's just a trail back to this open space area. Um, that's it, essentially. They're so how do they plan to, what are they, they're, they're going to subdivide off the 11th lot as the conservation uh, area, um, and who is it going to be, who's going to hold that? Not the town, I'm, I imagine. Are they going to have an HOA on the property? I'm not sure if it'll be an HOA or if it will be just held in private ownership. Okay. Uh, it might be, I think, you know, Bill Metros has said that he wants to move in there, that maybe he would own it in that 10th lot. But there'd be a conservation easement over it. You know, that easement could could be and would be partially enforced by the code enforcement officer. Um, could never be a portion of a building lot, but it, I think that they're planning on it being owned privately. I'm not but he sure is, about it. But he's willing to put a conservation easement on it and hold it, Metro's? I believe so. Okay. Uh, I know it would just be indeed. Uh, you know, deed on the property, but, uh, and that's not, full, you know, foolproof in, you know, if, if he sold it off, but um, good. Okay. At least it saves that much. Not, not that much of the woods, but at least it saves some. Okay. Any uh, more questions for Eric regarding this site plan? I'm a little curious about the proposed lot number 11. Um, I can't imagine anybody, I mean, Metro's may be proposing this now because he thinks it's going to help get him approval, but down the road, why would anybody want to own this piece of land? They can never earn any income on it, and it's constrained from development. Why, would, uh, why doesn't it make more sense for this lot to be part of lot 10? And that way, the person who, own, who, who owns lot 10, it'll be a big lot. It'll be mostly woods. The woods can have a conservation easement on it, but it, it's all part of the same piece. So otherwise, the, the person who, the next person after Metro's who wants to live in lot number 10 may not want lot 11. And then what's going to happen to lot 11? Who's yeah. going to take care of it? That's a very good point. The town code, though, prohibits the conserved land as part of a conservation subdivision from being included as a portion of a building lot. So it has to be a separate parcel from a lot that's developable. Well, that more or less means that there has to be a homeowners association then. And it's in the interests of the homeowners association to, to take care of that lot because they have to they have legal responsibility for it. So I, I think that should be part of our, part of the point we try to make that um, this needs to be resolved, uh, you know, if, yeah. before anything gets approved. Although I don't see why that, that particular um, um, provision of the of law makes sense here. What would be wrong with having that parcel uh, be part of lot 10? Um, Chris's concern with it generally is based a bit on experience with the Stablegate subdivision, I think mainly, uh, that there is or was supposed to be conservation easements on a lot of those parcels in uh, the Stablegate subdivision, but it, 
over time people have just cut down all or most of the treed area in there and put sheds back there all that good stuff and it's we've been advised that it's essentially unenforceable i think partially it's because either the easements weren't filed or filed to the same standard maybe is what we might do currently but we were advised that it's not enforceable there and so i think the town and Chris, who would be the enforcement officer here, are hesitant to put it on a building lot for fears of not being able to enforce it. I mean, that's what I was saying. If you even if you put it in a, on the deed, okay, and he, uh, on the deed, it, if you sell it again, it's not necessarily something that's going to hold because we don't there's nobody has any control the town does not have any control over any kind of deed information actually so anyway but you're right sarah linda i think that the remark is that they have to figure out what they're going to do with do with that in order to make sure that it is hap, that is preserved the way it sounds like metros wants to have it preserved but i don't know how and what that would be actually well a, a related question is who gets to use the trail is this a public trail or is it just limited to the 10 property owners i don't think that's been decided yet yeah the town board if it was dedicated to the town the town board would have to make a decision on it um i don't think that they probably would um and like i said i don't think it's been decided from the applicant's viewpoint what they want to do with it well so my feeling about that is that sh they should figure out what they want to do with it before anybody gives them any approval yeah i agree um i mean i don't see why the town would want it it's just a 1200 foot yeah. path to nowhere um yeah and the but the other the other obvious people that might have an interest would be the hammocks because it, it extends all the way to the east along the back of the hammocks so that the hammocks residents might very well enjoy having that as a extended way of walking around the block True. Uh, and you know through some woods or at least along the edge of the woods so i think we should recommend that they uh confer with the hammocks and see if any kind of a joint um plan for for development and continued main use and maintenance of a trail uh, shared by the two property owners might be worked out and so the hammocks owns the other end of that trail uh, on their on that that part of the property that's there at arsenal hill so that trail could go all the way around ham the hammocks actually and back into these woods I don't know if that's true. Yeah, look on the look on the site, look on the uh, on Encore, and I think and look at the. He owns that one. He owns this piece and, here. And that. But, but and, that one, no, that one belongs to Metro is also. He, he owns that, all the way to the city. Well, that's a private property. But it, it could it could connect in here to Thompson Lane. So, you know, it, yeah. it, it could be a loop trail. Uh-huh. But that's Not with the cooperation of the of the hammocks people. Yeah, it would probably also I mean I would think it would also need the city. I'd surprised if there is trails here that the city manager and the city planner didn't mention it, that that's a possibility. I'm not familiar with how this is drawn up. What's there. Eric, where, where's the town city line on this? It's right it's there. That yeah, right. Oh, I see. I see. That's in the city. Okay. Actually, at the PRC, we, I think the reason why it's got, um, why we may have suggested that the lot 11 um, be 
well, it had to be, you know, divided off, but was that the hope that the, the city and the town could come to some agreement about what they wanted to do with future trails there. So if that's not a possibility, then, then if Hammock Swanson gets involved in it, that's a good choice too, because they would have an opportunity for that around the, what they're doing there, their development that they're doing. Okay, any more questions? I, I just had one. I guess the roundabout that's in there, was that always in there or is that a new addition? I can't remember. It's the always been there. Okay, and that's a requirement for for that? Yeah. Or? Okay. Well, they need some sort of yeah. um, fire access or it's essentially fire access, but also snow plows that yeah. meets the town yeah. design okay. standards. They had a weird kind of teardrop one beforehand but I don't think that that met the town requirements. So now they have this uh, wider diameter one. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sarah Linda, wanna take us through the uh, recommendations? Okay, uh, the summary is request for preliminary subdivision approval for an 11 lot subdivision of two parcels totaling 7.1 acres under the conservation subdivision process. 10 home sites and one open space parcel are proposed. The site is open land for the first 20%, which is that should be uh, southernmost 20%, and then hardwood forest. All but the 3.3 acre open space parcel would be cleared for development. The combined parcels are 175 feet by by 1200 feet approximately, plus a narrow finger extending from the north end to the east across the back of the adjacent hammocks apartment complex. Proposal is to create a cul-de-sac drive with six parcels at 9,000 feet, 0.2 acres, three parcels at 13 to 15,000 square feet, which is three to 3.3 to 0.35 acres, one parcel at 2,300 square feet, that's parcel 10, and one open space parcel of 3.3 uh, acres. Ownership and maintenance of the open space parcel are under discussion. A landscaped evergreen buffer is proposed between the home sites and the hammocks. A gravel a dirt trail is proposed along the landscape buffer and through the woods extending to the east and to the east end of the hammocks property and towards Arsenal Hill in the city, but I'll take that off. Environmental concerns. The development would result in the loss of about half of the forest cover on the site. This would be partially offset by permanent protection of the remaining wooded lands, though ownership and management details remain to be resolved. The offer to create a recreation trail with potential links to other wooded sites within the city has long-term appeal. I think I would say that anyway, even if the city doesn't yeah. seem to be interested. Um, Maybe not interested today, but who knows about tomorrow? Well, it should be part of the discussion anyway. Yeah. Um, the recommendation is ECB recommends that the applicant inventory any large trees in lots eight, nine, and 10 for protection and continued life as yard trees if possible. ECB commends the applicant for the offer to conserve a significant part of the site's woods and to work with the town and city on a potential addition to the trail network and suggests that the matter of ownership of the conservation parcel and trail be resolved prior to final approval. And I think it should be not ownership, but also use, ownership and use. Okay, that sounds good. Um, okay, any additions or edits um, to the draft? Okay, then that's our rebuttal to this project. I, I was I was muted, but I was wondering in, in the past when you've had these uh, conservation subdivisions proposed, have there been HOA involvement uh, to to maintain the the open space? Always. Okay. <laughs> when when we haven't had it, that's what well that's what Eric was talking about about Stablegate, uh, and that's where the problems are. Yeah. A lot of them were supposed to have HOAs, but didn't get formed, like old Brookside, Stablegate, in one yeah. of the phases of Lakewood Meadows. 
I think pretty much every time they're supposed to have HOAs. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Now, we've learned the hard way, especially with Old Brookside. Okay. And is, is this be the smallest HOA that we have if, if it does go that way? Do we have any others Probably. that are only 10, 10 properties? No, I don't think so. I don't think so, yeah. I mean, um, that's, uh, you know, there. that should be part of the discussion. Is that um, really too small for a practical HOA? Or they don't really intend to have common services like common lawn mowing and snow plowing and stuff like that, or do they? Um, um, no, it's a, well, it's proposed to be dedicated the road, so it's not, we need snow plows, maybe trail maintenance, and there will have to be a stormwater maintenance agreement because it's not in a drainage district. Um, and what about, so the, what about the landscaping the, on the border with hammocks there, just on the side where the driveway comes up or the road comes up? Who would be maintaining yeah. that? Because they do have plantings and things like that on the site plan. Yeah, I so, think that remains to be addressed as part of this. It is on that open space lot, so that should be part of that. I would think they probably need an HOA or some sort of common agreement, but you're right. I mean, if you have five board members to an HOA and there's 10 people that live there, yeah. the elections yeah. are probably pretty weird. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't give a whole lot of upside to the homeowners association there. I mean, all these poor 10 people or nine of them at least are just getting a bill once a year and unless they happen to love walking on a trail for 1200 feet and back they're not getting anything for that so it seems to me that that's not an ideal setup yeah well, hopefully it, it's a weird for, one right. so. okay um oh, i'm sure that all of that will be uh, uh, on the planning board's agenda also. Um, okay, going on now to HP, uh, uh, CPN 20-067, Dagger Sketch Plan Review. County Road 60 and Ashton Place. Eric? This is quite you got different. another one? <laughs> quite different than the ones that you've seen before. Yeah. Uh, iterations before were kind of a cul-de-sac up here, a road over through 5B3, and then, you know, a road down through the older section of Fox Ridge through East Ridge Run. Uh, this iteration shows that a large portion of the parcel would be annexed into uh, this parcel at the end of Lake Breeze Way, um, and then there would be seven lots created out of this one kind of down off Ashton. You know, there's one cul-de-sac there, pretty much right at the end of where the road is today. Um, and then one and a half acre lots essentially kind of back here. Oh, uh, John just sent to everybody a yeah. history of the applications and whatnot. Um, I, think, I think we've I've, seen that one. Yeah. It's a very I've, interesting, I've very interesting building. detail. Yeah. And then conservation easements kind of around here in the buffer areas. Um, and then also kind of up here, which is a neat little touch. So hopefully. What's the neat drive. little touch? The conserved areas in between the driveways sort of so that as you're driving up these private drives, hopefully you'll have some nice like kind of trees in between there, in between the driveway and the homes to buffer it, make it nice, I guess. But, okay, is that it? That's it. Okay, questions for Eric? Okay, Sarah Linda, want to take us through? Well, I have, a question. I have a question for Eric. Um, was there any discussion about the development of the back portion of the lot in connection with Lake Breezeway? No. No. 
So that just disappears as far as this goes. Um, and yeah, then we have to deal one, with it later. This lot right here was approved for a single family home, essentially back here. Um, I mean, the plan right now, and I think this piece also, this portion of 5E3 would be annexed to there. I think the plan is that this parcel just remains in that ownership and undeveloped, essentially. Okay. okay. Well, my concern about that is that um, by doing this subdivision, you, you essentially constrain future development of the entire western half of the site, which actually you want to on the steep slope area, but you've got this other area between the steep slope area and this new parcel with the seven homes on it that sooner or later somebody's going to want to develop and there won't be any way to get to it other than the steep slope. through Lake Breeze Way and the steep slope or through the Mui property to the south, which was one of the alternatives that we we looked at, but I don't know why that didn't pan out. Anyway, but let me go through the, um, my, my draft here. This is the latest in a long series of conceptual subdivision layouts with a combination of single family homes and conservation lands. In this proposal, the 44 acre site is subdivided on a north south line with about 60% at the west end of the site to be annexed to an adjacent parcel with access from Lake Breezeway. The remaining 40% is divided into seven lots of between 1.4 and two acres each, plus an eighth lot of 4.9 acres to be designated as conservation lands. The conservation parcel is made up of narrow perimeter buffers and lands separating the three driveways serving the seven proposed homes. The home parcels comply with the town's lot size requirements, but not with its lot width requirements of 125 feet. The lots are roughly pie shaped, all coming off a single cul-de-sac. Environmental concerns. The portion of the site with the significant conservation value is the west end of the parcel, which contains mature woods and steep slopes. The sketch plan provides no indication of the future use of this area. Any future use of the 60% of the site to be annexed to Lake Breeze Way will require access through the steep slope and wooded part of the site. This is a short-sighted approach. The proposed conservation land has minimum, minimal conservation value either based on its natural resources or its configuration. The conservation subdivision provisions of the town law are intended to allow flexibility in site planning in exchange for protection of the most significant natural resources on a development parcel. This plan fails to achieve this goal, to put it mildly. I thought this plan was by far the worst of all the ones that we've seen. That's an aside. So, can I say um, the reason why they're not showing development up here and connecting and whatnot is because of that fire code requirement about getting 30 lots, essentially. Um, it doesn't make financial sense for them to do it, is my understanding. So they're proposing the amount of lots that they can build off those to meet the 30, which includes all those off Ashton Place. It doesn't preserve this land up here because essentially it's part of the conservation subdivision or it's part of this whole plan. This line would be drawn before any conservation subdivision process. It's a lot line adjustment doesn't need to go through the conservation subdivision process. So as you're looking at this as a conservation subdivision, you can consider it as that just with this piece right here. And so if this is the conservation subdivision that you're looking for, really the only constrained land is probably the stream that runs down towards the bottom and the buffer from it. Um, at that point, they're just conserving the 40% from there. I don't well, know whether it's cited, but it probably would retain this as open space, at least for the very long term, until somebody decided to develop the Van Isingham property and somehow connect it to East Ridge Run. But that's kind of my thought on it being short sighted. Your your assumption is that say that again? 
it would it would be retained as open space by well to your point owner. i mean it'd be, is aren't it could be developed or yeah it couldn't really be developed after as long as it's part of these couple parcels it really couldn't be subdivided off not realistically um without some sort of second access way the only other access to it if not through lake breezeway which again this is where the homeowner lives i don't think that he's going to build a big road through here anytime soon he's building his house right now it's through the van isgum property if that was ever developed or through muey's property in east ridge run both of which probably wouldn't happen for any timeline and if it came through the van isgum property it likely would need that secondary access through muey's and whatnot again i don't think that it's going to happen uh, at least not in the short run um, and so for at least a long period of time this will be preserved that's my guess anyways i don't know what their future plans are exactly but i believe that's what they plan on doing and that's probably realistic i don't know i don't, I don't find that um a convincing argument in support of this site plan um, i think that because of its location there is going to be development pressure for that rear portion of the site and um you know i well what if, what if in this in the subdivision and dividing it in, into two different parcels that that the uh, wooded area becomes a conservation easement now i mean that's well, really about the that's about the only way that and and whether it's connected to lake breeze fox ridge or, or wherever they want to connect it um that would be certainly um the only way to preserve it yeah i i would agree if they would take yeah. this slope and put a conservation easement on that i mean there's already a i gather a conservation easement on the portion of it that's straight to the south which also belongs to Venezia, right? Yes. Uh, they could just extend that conservation easement to the north and uh, encompass this whole sl steep slope area, and that would protect it. So, yeah. you know, that would be fine as far as I'm concerned. But th this we could this ask them to, but it would good. really be done a lot line adjustment as opposed to a con or a subdivision, because again, this portion being annexed to there, it's administrative. Yes. Okay, so is there a problem with that? What asking? I mean, I mean, it's just a different process, right? Well, what I mean is that there's the conservation subdivision process might require them to conserve land. Does require them to conserve constrained land, but altering these lot lines to annex this portion to this parcel wouldn't be a conservation parcel or subdivision. It would be a lot line adjustment. There is no requirement in the lot line adjustment that they conserve that land. Uh, that's right. I agree. But what I'm saying is, what I'm suggesting is that somebody put a conservation easement on it, and then it's okay. protected, because because from what you know we've been talking about, Sarah Linda's expressing here is that we don't have any confidence now that when this happens, that it wouldn't be more messy for this um, for this. Uh, conservation resource to be really screwed up in the future because it is because of where it is and because of the development pressure in it around it so if the if the developer wants to make sure that this is going to be preserved in some way he doesn't know how maybe but he could put it in the conservation easement now and then we'd all be sure that it's going to be preserved. So putting a conservation easement on a portion of the rear lot could be a condition of approval of the uh, of the subdivision that he's looking yeah. for. Yeah. Okay. So that could be in our remarks. Um, what do people feel, just looking at the lot to be subdivided here, um, 
how do the board members feel about the proposed conservation lands? Well, I think it gets back to those narrow corridors that basically have no value um, that we've commented on before that'll probably either be maintained to the line by the homeowners or, or whatever. I mean, um, I think we made the, the notes previously because what are they probably five to six foot swaths that run, what is it, a hundred and something feet? Right. Yeah, that, that was my reaction too. I mean, we've, we've said this every time it's come up, they keep trying to put the conservation lands in places where it has no use and it's on space that has no conservation value. So this is a, effectively just not a, not what the conservation subdivision is supposed to be. Exactly. And it's a sketch plan. So I think we should be fairly straightforward in telling them this is just, you know, just doesn't make it as a conservation <laughs> subdivision. I, yeah, I think we've had this, we've had this conversation before. I mean, you know, kind of many times about this exact subject. So it's not going to be, I think we should say it in our recommendations and, and, and maybe someone will get the, the notion of what it is meaningful conservation lands are. Well, maybe what we should do is to say, um, we, we have no use for this particular um, a configuration of conservation lands as he's shown it. However, in our view, if he would, as an alternative, put a conservation easement on the steep slope area in, you know, whatever it was he was originally talking about, 11 acres or something like that, then he doesn't need to do any conservation land down here. He can divide the whole thing up into the seven parcels yeah, plus the cul-de-sac and leave it at that. I think that's a good recommendation. What does everybody else think? Yes. Yeah. It is too. I think we'd get the conservation easement then that we'd be looking for, the protections for that, which has been our main concern all along. And then the developer could, you know, kind of yeah, do what yeah. he needed to do with the other parts without having to fudge it, you know? <laughs> yes, I think that's exactly <laughs> what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a legal word here. Well, <laughs> the planning vocabulary, we but. understand it, yes. <laughs> Technical term, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Sarah Linda has uh, those uh, notes uh, for the recommendation then. Do you need anything else from us, Sarah Linda? Um, no, I'll rework the recommendation and send it out to everybody for your okay. Okay, thank you very much. That is the last application on our referrals today. Okay, moving right along. I don't even know what time it is. It's probably getting late. Um, let's see, we're up to old business. Uh, the EC, uh, ECB page for the town newsletters, the October newsletter is coming out probably, it, I, uh, Sarah said either late this afternoon or tomorrow. I haven't received it yet, but that doesn't mean it's not there. I just haven't looked. And it is about bats. And the one thing that I would alert you to is there is this really wonderful bat video that's been included with uh, a thing that, uh, an article that says amazing facts about bats. And it gives you all kinds of amazing 10, I think, or so facts about um, bats and what they're good for and why we need them so much and then there's this very cute little video only about six minutes long and it uh kind of is discrediting their bad reputation bats and where it came from there's dracula in there and there's all kinds of interesting it's perfect for halloween and it's perfect for families to view so all of you who have children or grandchildren will want to be able to show this to them because it's pretty cute and john maybe you could put the video uh when you when it when you see it in the newsletter put it on our um our ecb web page somewhere uh maybe it's on the kids part maybe that's where it would be best because it's very it's very cute okay so um, in November, um, Gary has offered to do a November newsletter. Gary, the deadline for that newsletter is usually, let me see if I can get my calendar out here, probably going to be in the week of, I'd say like October 21st. 
and um, and you could send that to me, and then I'll make sure that I meet the deadline for the newsletter to Sarah. But um, have you kind of thought about what you might want to put in a newsletter? Yeah, well, what, keeping what uh, yeah, keeping with the uh, flora and fauna theme, maybe uh, something on wild wild turkeys, perhaps. Oh, if that hasn't love been done. it. That or feral cats. I think the the turkeys might be. <laughs> Do both. Hey, what's in your environment now? Um, sounds good. I like. I like that. Sounds. How? Anybody else have any suggestions for Gary uh, that that might be interesting? That we haven't we haven't done wild turkeys and we haven't done anything like that. So we do have a wildlife um, protocol that we need to kind of from the open space manual, which talks about wildlife and everything. So that would be a good, we could write that off on our implementation table when we get that one. Okay, well, if you need anything from me um, or maybe I'll call you and we'll just kind of work things through a um, number of words, that kind of stuff. Okay, so then we have December and we don't have anything for December yet, but um, I'm thinking of, it, this would be whatever newsletter we have in December would be uh, very similar to what the display case uh, would hold. And we had talked about, Edith, this is some time ago, about kind of doing uh, wildlife footprints in the snow kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah those, those kinds of things yeah. would be, mm -hmm. because we haven't done anything like that either. Yes. And then maybe there could be a December newsletter who would kind of draw all the attention to that display or vice versa or whatever. Is that newsletter article something that you could do or should we? Yes, yes, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put your name here then. Okay. And um, as far as the display case goes, um, probably I would imagine, um, Michelle is out still and when she gets back, I don't know if she has any plans for the display case. So we probably have to, unless you know, Eric, right now, if there's anything in the works for any other department that wants to use the display case once we take ours down, because ours is, haven't heard, okay, then if you just want to keep in mind that we are willing, the ECB is willing to fill that space and we would fill it with a winter topic sometime i think like the end of november what do you think edith would that be a good time i think we yes, might, i think that would work very well might be getting some snow we leave that that yeah. one up for about four months and then we'll see what the new year brings what spring brings yes yeah okay so that's we've got our display case then in at the end of november um okay the other thing that we want to talk about here is um, the information session with the ECB and the code enforcement officer. And I have had a conversation with Chris and, you know, he's because Michelle is out, he's very busy and not only busy because of that, but he's also busy with um, other things. And um, uh, it probably will be held in 2021 or either in December. We don't, I don't know yet. So we're just going to keep that on our agenda and we'll see how that moves forward. Um, for new business, we're going to think about a couple of things here in our November meeting, and one is going to be our 2021 projects plan. So John, I'm hoping that you and I can develop an implement, implementation table for 2020 so that we can, that can be presented in our November. I can give you a call and we can talk about it. And I have a list of things that really we, all we need to do is just to put them in the appropriate um, spaces, the appropriate place on the spreadsheet. And from that, we can kind of figure out where we want to go in 2021. I think we'll know where we've been this year. It's been such a chaotic year um, that mm -hmm. all of our plans were entirely uh, disrupted, but we have been doing some, some things which we will record. Mm -hmm. And um, the other thing we'll be using is our implementation table. So we'll see that next time. But we're also going to see, um, Eric, did the town board approve and adopt the NRI inventory? They did. I think that there was some stuff missing from the resolution that they need to address before adopting it. 
Okay, so they haven't adopted it yet. Um, the reason why I was hoping that we would be able to get to that next period is because there are a couple of things in the NRI which are directly related to the next steps, kind of implementation implementation of some suggestions there. And I wonder if the town board would be um, wanting the ECB to have responsibility for the implementations. So maybe I'll talk, Eric, maybe you could talk with Doug when you see him, if you're going to redo, or if you, you know, just find out for us if those four things, you know what I'm talking about, Eric, the four things? Uh, yeah, but we can follow up afterwards. I'm not, I guess okay. I'm not clear. We okay. All right. Um, sure. Let's do that. And then uh, to see if the town board wants us to assume responsibility for those implementations or if the town board would prefer the CIC to do it. So we, we have some, you know, some flexibility there with that, whatever their wish. And then if we are going to be implementing them, it's our responsibility, we can start doing that in 2021 and that, that will provide some information for our projects plan to go forward. Okay. That's really all I have. Does anybody have any questions? We're also looking, I'm starting to do some notes here for our, um, oh, yes, for our report, for our annual report. And that's coming up in December. We'd have to have that approved by December. So by next meeting, um, I'll either have a sample of that or either we will talk about what we want to put in. But we have to know when we're putting in there what we've actually done. So I'd like to see that implementation table for 2020 and then uh, take a look at that. It's much easier to pull up facts when they're all in front of you instead of having to kind of remember what in the heck we did this year, um, as complicated as it was. Okay, anything else that we need to take care of? It's getting to be the end of the year. Okay, let's go to member reports. CIC. Pat, do you want to kind of give us a rundown if anything of importance happened at the CIC, what we're working on? We know I'm what we're working I'm on. I'm wondering if I missed a meeting. Did we just have one other than? No, just our last one. I got to try to remember. That's terrible. My, <laughs> yeah, me brain, too. Is so, my <laughs> brain is so full of survey stuff, I can't tell you. <laughs> Um, I think what the only thing that we looked at and we took and we discussed was the um, affordable housing options. Yes, that's right. We did. Yeah. We started and talking we, about we that. We had a whole meeting. Eric, you were, uh, you were at that meeting too, right? Is there anything yep. that you, uh, from that affordable housing that uh, you recall that maybe would interest the ECB members, our progress oh, there? You know, I hope that everybody's supportive of it. It's a very important thing to do for the town of Canandaigua, especially considering I think 26 or 27 percent of the population of the town, according to the census, mm -hmm. is cost burdened by housing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the big thing that came out of it is that we want to get more information from the people involved um, to give us a clear indicator of where we should put our focus and what changes need to be made. So talking to developers, to see what they run into when trying to build housing that maybe increases costs, or if they are, if they do have a focus on affordable housing, again, what what maybe increased costs or what hampers their ability to do that. Um, and then also talking to groups that help locate affordable housing or place people in affordable housing, like Pathstone, um, Housing Promise, um, Habitat for Humanity, places like that, um, to see or to get a clear indication of maybe what is working, not working, you know, where houses are maybe needed, what maybe associated services are important, um, stuff like that. It's a big topic for our town, I yes. think. It's an important topic for us. And um, I think we'll be talking about this for, for a while now. And of course, the um, uptown area could be an area where affordable housing might be very appropriate. So that's another option here um, as we you know, delve into the subject. And uh, the CIC, I think, is pretty motivated to uh, be able to understand the options uh, for our town and then you know, maybe work towards uh, having something happen. That would be great. 
Okay, local history team. Sarah, Linda, anything to report from local history? Um, no, we're kind of on a um, slow mode here. Not doing much. We're doing newsletter newsletter articles. That's about it. Yeah, the, I like the, the I like the photos that, and the parades and all that kind of stuff. It was it was a great article. Thank you for for sharing that um, with the rest of the town. Uh, the environmental committee. Um, the environmental committee, unfortunately, was I was not able to attend, and um, actually, we're lo I'm looking for somebody from the ECB to take my place if uh, on that committee. Um, so, if any of you are interested in working in the recycling um, areas, uh, sustainability areas, anything like that, let me know. Uh, it would be great if there was a representative on the ECB, uh, from the ECB to the Environmental Committee. Um, I think they have some interesting things that they're planning uh, coming up in January. And, uh, and it, you know, it's just an important part of our town now. I think they're going to do something like a swap meet and, and you know, things like that. But um, it does need some participation and hopefully we could send a representative there. Natural resource inventory, I think we just talked about that. It's in the towns, uh, on, was on their agenda. It's gone back. So evidently we'll, uh, we'll see it see next month then um, if indeed they do approve that. Uh, that also brings to mind the training that it was supposed to come from that. It sounds as though we weren't gonna have that training until it was actually approved or adopted, I mean. And uh, so the training will be set probably not now and not until 2021. I have this feeling. The tree board. Edith. Yeah. Yes. What happened Dennis, to the tree board? Well, Dennis Brewer and I and uh, Dan, um, Marion, it's his last name, Mar who are yeah. two parks and six cemeteries this <laughs> Saturday and looked at the trees in particular. Two of them need some <laughs> urgent action, I would say. Um, Tilton Cemetery that is on New Michigan Road has a number of de dead and dying hickory trees, a couple of which have the possibility of striking telephone and electric lines. Uh oh and as well as coming down and crushing stones. Sand Hill Cemetery on Emerson Road is um, problematic in that there are some dead branches hung up and some an old uh, black uh, locust trees. But the main problem at Sand Hill is that the west property line is very undefined uh -oh. It's covered with brush and it is full of Alanthus trees, which are attractive to spotted lanternflies. Yeah. And there are many, many, many of these things. They spread like crazy and um, have very weak wood, so they come down pretty quickly. Until we know exactly whose Alanthus trees those are, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be hard to know what to do with them. We were hoping that maybe when the leaves come down, we can find a property marker and tell, you know, what those, whose trees those might be. I think given the threats of spotted lanternfly. We have it now. It's, would in, like it's on Long it Island. On. Yes, I know. And it has yeah. devastated all kinds of acreages of woods and vineyards and orchards in Pennsylvania, which is not very far away. So uh, the, the, the work is line and the, and the species of trees were two issues that I could see needed to be addressed as soon as we can. There are um, Ham Cemetery over on 21, is very small and it, Dennis is concerned about it because it's very muddy. The tree cover is so thick that the grass will not grow. So we were um, 
considering recommending thinning trees and uh, I think that a ground cover would be better than grass there to prevent the, the mud. These are most of them historic cemeteries. I think only uh, the one on Woolhouse Road is actually still much in use, although mm -hmm. there has been a recent burial in Sand Hill. But they are of historic interest and they are the town's property to keep up. Um, we did write up a report and oh, I think it was uh, Dennis thought he had sent it to you. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> haven't received it. Okay. No, no. Well, I will. <laughs> I will uh, send you a copy myself then. Okay, but, thank you. Um, it was um, Gary. Did you get a copy of that? I I, I did not. I, I missed the uh, field trip. I've been down in North Carolina. Okay, so Edith, if you could please put Gary send that to Gary and I, that we'd appreciate it. I, okay. I don't know why we're. I will. Well, I you know I sent the committee list. <laughs> yes, I sent the copy to Dennis and to Dan and said you know add or subtract whatever uh -huh. Uh -huh. what I had drawn up. And Dan added a few things and sent it back and I sent it on to Dennis and, and he was going to circulate it. So I will make sure okay. to do that. Okay, maybe he's going to send it to Sarah uh, for that. Well, could Sarah's be. not, you know, she's Yeah, I know. She's not in, in town on Tuesdays, but yeah. okay, yeah. Okay, but there are some issues with dead trees and things that need to be taken care of so yeah. that they don't crash down. But uh, we will probably pursue more. We stopped at Schoolhouse Park and at Onanda, the lakeside part, and looked at those trees and assessed what was going on. Emerald ash borer is a problem in some of the places, and those are a death sentence, of course. Yes, right. Okay, look forward to reading that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, we had our sexual harassment training. I hope everybody got that in when they could, or I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I went to the town hall and sat through it. Did you? <laughs> I did. Yeah. I was online. I think there's a, Pat, were you online too? Somebody else. Oh, Sarah Linda, you were there online, weren't you? Yeah. All right, guys that didn't do it or people that didn't do it, I think you still have to do it by the end of the year. I think they'll be in someone, Sarah, I mean, uh, Sam will be in touch with you. I am sure. All right, that's the end of our agenda. Is there anything else that uh, we need to discuss from anyone? Okay, then I will move to uh, adjourn. May I have a second? Sure. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, everybody, we'll see you next month. I think it's October, or let's see, yeah, October the 8th. November. November. Oh, November. Oh, my gosh. Oh, sorry. Oh, boy. Yes, that's November. You're right. It's November 5th. November 5th, 4.30. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. Right. Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks.